This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the, uh, that we gather tonight on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, my name is Sam Croc. I'm one of the 2019 editors and I have the great pleasure of introducing the Victorian Ombudsman, uh, Deborah Glass OBE, to give the 2019 Melbourne University Law Review Annual Lecture. Ms Glass was appointed as Victorian Ombudsman in March 2014 for a term of 10 years. She was raised in Melbourne where she studied law at Monash University. Ms. Glass practiced law briefly in the city before joining a US investment bank in Switzerland in 1985. She was appointed to the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission at its inception in 1989, where she became senior director, instrumental in raising standards in the investment management industry. Ms. Glass moved to London in 1998, where she became the chief executive of the Investment Management Regulatory Organization. In 2001, she joined the UK Police Complaints Authority and in 2004 became a commissioner with the new Independent Police Complaints Commission of England and Wales, the IPCC. She was the commissioner responsible for London and for many high profile criminal and misconduct investigations into police conduct. Ms Glass was appointed the IPCC Deputy Chair in 2008, carrying <laughs> operational responsibility for the IPCC's regional commissioners and was awarded an OBE for her service in the New Year's Honours list in 2012. Ms Glass is committed to ensuring fair and reasonable decision making in the Victorian public sector and to improving public administration. She holds a firm belief in public sector integrity and the protection of human rights. Please make her feel very welcome. Thank you very much, Sam. I'm still waiting for the day when somebody gets up and says the Ombudsman needs no introduction. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Melbourne University. In time more of uh, tradition, can you hear me at the back? Yes. Good. Uh, I would like first to acknowledge, and you can see this magnificent artwork here, that Melbourne University stands on the traditional lands of the people of the Kulin Nation, land that always was and always will be Aboriginal land. This painting is by an Aboriginal prisoner. And it hangs in our conference room as a reminder to us of the impact of colonisation and the importance of reconciliation. So here I am, Melbourne University. Now, after accepting the kind invitation of the Law Review, thank you very much to speak at this illustrious event, um, I looked at the list of my previous, uh, the previous speakers that you, uh, who spoke at the Law Review, and I thought, what am I doing here in the company of all these distinguished jurists? They, um, it looked like all my pre predecessors had uh, an honourable in front of their name. You know, you had, uh, you had the Honourable Justice Mortimer and Honourable Justice Hayne and quite a few other honourable. I think they were all honourables, am I right? Um, well, look, I like to think of myself as an honourable ombudsman, but I don't have a hon, as Nancy Mitford used to say. Um, and I didn't make my mark, I will share with you, as a great legal genius. Uh, in fact, I was uh, a pretty average law student. Uh, truth of the matter, there were two law schools uh, back in um, my day. There was here and there was the other place. Uh, and I chose the other place with all the uh, decision-making skills of the average 17-year-old uh, because it had a reputation for being socially progressive and it looked like more fun. So I was, um, I was pretty lucky to emerge with a degree at all, considering how much time I, I spent having fun uh, in the psychotropic haze that emerged from the Monash cafes back in the 70s. But now to my topic. In the case you're wondering uh, what it means, it comes from a John Mortimer quote. John Mortimer, Rumpole of the Bailey. Uh, and I quote, no brilliance is needed in the law. Nothing but common sense and relatively clean fingernails. So, I could have called it common sense and clean fingernails, but I thought that sounded just a bit too weird. So, um, and by the way, thank you all for being here tonight, uh, because I, I, I gather, I noticed from the Melbourne University's list of free lectures that um, 
I'm competing tonight with a lecture on native animal surprises, lessons from the field. Are you aware of that? Uh, it's on the McGlynn Davis School of, the, of Design, I believe, somewhere not too far from here. So if you are expecting something um, very erudite, I'll give you a chance to leave now and bone up on your zoology. Uh, but for those of fine, okay, we're happy to stay, that's fine. So for those of you who uh, are left, um, as I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not approaching my topic from the standpoint of any great legal erudition. What can I impart to you this evening? Well, to make a change in the usual law lectures that um, those students among you uh, generally listen to, I am not going to cite any cases this evening except one because it has my name in it. I, in fact, I only ever refer to cases that have my name in them, uh, of which there are now a few, and it's quite an interesting way to be immortalised. Uh, my legal legacy may well be um, glassed into the President of the Legislative Council uh, and the Attorney General for the State of Victoria. Uh, Who's familiar with that case, by the way? Anybody read it? No? Oh, well, you go back and do your homework after that one. Uh, well, that very excitingly for me went all the way to the High Court uh, until they refused leave to appeal. And what that did was confirm my jurisdiction to investigate members of Parliament upon referral by Parliament. Now, I'm not here to talk, talk about red shirts, um, but that case certainly kept me very busy last year. Look, that's the end of my case citations. What I really want to talk about this evening is fairness and justice as opposed to the law, and yes, sometimes they are opposed. Now, I'm guessing everyone in this room is at least broadly familiar with the role of the Ombudsman. Would I be right? Anybody here not have any idea what an Ombudsman does? Not that you're going to admit to, I suppose. Um, but um, when I studied admin law in, you know, in the other place, um, which is a few short years after the Ombudsman Act came into existence. I'm giving myself away there. Uh, I'm pretty sure it wasn't on the curriculum. Uh, or possibly I was in too much of a psychotropic haze to notice. Now, I am the fifth Victorian Ombudsman. Uh, it's a bit like being the latest incarnation of Doctor Who, by the way. And, 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 you know, and like the latest incarnation of Doctor Who, I am the first woman to do the job. Now, when, um, when I came into the role, you know, numbers of people said to me, you've got some really big shoes to fill. And I said, that may be, but I'm the first to do it in heels. So my gender provoked a certain amount of comment in my first year, and I kept getting asked what it felt like. You know, what does it feel like to be the first female ombudsman of the state of Victoria? And I used to reply, you know, there are lots of, re you know, lots of responses to that, but it was actually a bit of a culture shock for my staff who had to get used to finding the Ombudsman in the ladies. The, um, now, I've, um, I'm halfway through my ten-year term. I'm a statutory appointment. I have a ten-year term, which is marvellous for actually having a vision for the role. Uh, but when you start a ten-year term, it's really good to get some historical perspective. So, what's the, you know, what are the origins of the office? You know, what are the origins of the Ombudsman? It, the Victorian Ombudsman goes back to 1973, the, the Ombudsman Act of 73, but actually the origins of the institution go back a lot further than that. In fact, you can take it back at least to Rome, ancient Rome. And this uh, gentleman you see on the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the picture is one of the tribunes of the plebs. Now, the tribunes of the plebs were, in fact, a kind of forerunner to the Ombudsman. What you're talking about here is um, somebody who was there to, to provide support for the, the, the public, the, the plebs, against the patricians. Uh, the first ombudsman of that name, of course, here he is, was in Sweden in 1810. Um, and that's where the word comes from. But the real growth in the ombo business, as we like to call it, actually goes back to the growth, huge growth in bureaucratic decision making in the second half of the 20th century. In fact, New Zealand was the first Commonwealth country to have an ombudsman. It was back in 1962. And I love reading Hansard debates, and I, I read quite a few of them when I came into the role. And I just want to read you a few quotes from these, because there was some fabulous debate about the merits or otherwise of the institution of the ombudsman. So the idea of the ombudsman was variously described as a busybody or a snooper, and in some cases, a menace. And I suspect there were a few politicians 50 years later who would agree with that. But the point was made over and over again, and I, and I quote, 
the balance between the citizen and the state has over a long period been swinging more and more in favor of the state. This concentration of power in the state has made it all the more essential in a democracy that the citizen should be protected against the abuses of power. And he goes on to say, this is the Attorney General of, 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 of New Zealand, not so much the conscious or malicious abuses of power, the genuine mistakes, misjudgments, and what may be termed unreasonable decisions which are inevitable wherever power is exercised. So it's clear from the debates, there was some nervousness from MPs about uh, uh, how he, because of course it would be a he, uh, would actually do that. Uh, but they also thought, and I quote again, the very existence of someone to whom the people can turn will be a comfort. And in the case of the chronic malcontents, could even be psychotherapeutic. The commissioner might even become known as the great healer. Now this passage, which I love, was quoted in the Victorian debates in 1973, when the, the then member for Melbourne, the integral Barry Jones, added, it did not turn out quite like that. Love it. Now, whether or not ombudsmen are great healers, the function was increasingly recognized as necessary to deal with the challenge of administrative unfairness in complex bureaucracies, because the law isn't good enough or isn't fair enough. Now, I'm going to talk about fairness and justice tonight. So perhaps I should ask, you know, what actually is this? You know, this is a, is fairness a relative concept? Does my fairness differ for your fairness? You know, is, is today's fairness different from what fairness was like 50 years ago when the Ombudsman Act came in? And what do fairness and justice really have to do with the law? Well, I'm not going to attempt to define fairness tonight, and I'll park that alongside the reasonable man reasonable person now, of course, if you're a reasonable man in my day, for the academics in the room. If there are any, I don't think I neglected to ask that question at the outset. But look, let me first set out, you know, just for a brief, you know, going back to the law for a very brief moment, the basis of my own decision making. Here is my act, 1973, and the various things I can do. I'm not proposing to quote um, anything of that except a very small bit, because I can form opinions under my act, that a decision is, among other things, contrary to law or unreasonable. I can consider whether it's inconsistent with human rights, whether it's improperly discriminatory, whether it's oppressive, or this is my personal favorite, just plain wrong. Now these categories broadly reflect the grounds of review and administrative law, of course, you know, um, with a few added charms. But in practice, when I am looking at administrative decisions as the ombudsman, it boils down to a very simple question. What were they thinking? And we developed this, you know, decision, um, decision, we call it, you know, informally, but it's a bit of a joke, you know, decision uh, chart around looking at a decision. Was it okay? All the way through to what? And I'm going to share with you this evening a few of those what's. Now, again, just a bit more background about the Ombudsman, because courts can make orders, of course. I can't make orders. I can't enforce what I do. I rely on the art of persuasion to make recommendations to remedy an error and improve public administration. And my persuasion is, of course, helped by my Royal Commission powers, and most particularly by my ability to table reports in Parliament. Now, my office gets tens of thousands of complaints every year. And I deal with complaints about over a thousand public bodies, including all state government departments, all those that sit within them, and all local councils. And in many, in fact, and probably most of the complaints I get, the catch cry is that the decision was not fair. Now, in fact, many of the decisions we see are perfectly fair, although all too often they've been poorly communicated, and sometimes it's the complainant who's unreasonable. Uh, but we do see some cases which really fall into this category, and many of them about the exercise of discretion. So I want to reflect on the role the Ombudsman plays in that, and the, the kind of patterns we've observed. You know, we see reasonable rules that have been unfairly applied. We see unreasonable rules. We see a failure to make case-by-case -case judgments, and our old friends, uh, human error and poor communication. 
So the first example I want to share with you, it, it's an old case, but it is one that, that, you know, that I still uh, shake my head over. This was the week after the Black Saturday bushfires in 2009. A disabled woman living in the Dandenongs had her car clamped by the sheriff. It was Friday afternoon, fires are still threatening the area, and she rang my office in a state of considerable distress because she wanted to be able to evacuate, but she couldn't because the sheriff refused to unclamp her car until the debts she owed were paid. Now, after my officers called the sheriff and pointed out this was wholly unreasonable, the car was duly unclamped. So she accepted her liability for the debt and the clamping of her car, but not on a day that basically threatened her life. And he had to ask, you know, not only did it put her at risk, what were the sheriff's officers doing out in the Dandenongs on a high fire day today clamping cars? And we had to ask ourselves, what were they thinking? <laughs> now, we also see discretion being expressly permitted in the law, but not exercised. And this next example <coughs> is about Victoria's Office of Housing, which of course has discretion to recover compensation from public housing tenants for their damaged property. Now, that's right, you wouldn't expect people to get away with damaging public property. But we found a default practice of the department raising claims for almost the entire cost of repairing a vacated property without taking into account any of the tenant's circumstances. So the case I'm going to tell you about is about an Aboriginal woman who had been evicted by the department because they wrongly assumed that she had abandoned it. And what happened here is that officials turned up in response to application for a transfer and they found it vacant and badly damaged. They assumed she didn't live there and they initiated proceedings in VCAT to uh, evict her. She didn't turn up because the notice was sent as they all routinely are, to the address that she had left. Uh, and they made, and she was issued with a $20,000 bill for the damage to the property. Now, the department didn't know because they made no effort to find out that the damage had been caused by a violent partner. And she didn't even know about the bill until she applied again to the Department for Services. So you had to ask, again, what were they thinking? Now, happily, we were able to say we're having to initiate a Supreme Court appeal on a point of law, and after our intervention, the department waived the debt, they apologised to her, and they found her alternative accommodation. And I'm also really happy to report that practices changed following our report, and that cases to VCAT on these matters are markedly down, a just outcome for all, I like to think. And let's reflect that the Ombudsman could consider the applicability of the department's procedures guiding it in its discretion something that, of course, tribunals and courts don't do. Another example, you may be familiar, I hope you're not too familiar, with uh, alcohol interlock devices, which are obviously a good thing for stopping people driving drunk on our roads. Uh, now, we dealt with a case where Vic Roads had recorded a violation against the licence of a woman who'd had one of these devices. And, of course, you know, these rules are all set out very, very carefully. Now, this woman had dropped her car off at a car wash to be cleaned. And while it was there, the device had sounded for a breath test to be provided. And of course, you know, nobody provided one. The camera recorded this. That's actually, if you can see really carefully, there's a man cleaning the back of her car. Now, as it happened, when the, you know, she came back to the car, the device sounded again and she provided a clean sample. So he clearly was not driving drunk. But Vic Rhodes recorded a violation and then decided not to revoke it because the regulations say that when it's unclear who's in possession of the vehicle, when a sample is not produced, it could. So that would have meant for her having to, you know, to keep the device in her car for another six months, which would cost her over $1,000. Now, it could make that decision. Vic Rhodes could make that decision. But what were they thinking? I'm happy to report that following our intervention, Vic Rhodes withdrew the violation. And you have to ask yourself, you know, why do such things happen? Now, one um, explanation is there's a kind of nervousness about taking too much into your hands when you're a public servant, because it's safest to be cautious, you know, when you might get criticised. You know, there's a, there's a sort of computer says no, you know, syndrome. Or it's easiest to assume that, you know, that may means must, because that way you don't have to think when you make a decision. You don't have to make a decision at all. Now, moving on to our old friend, um, human error. We all make mistakes, 
but sometimes public servants are not keen to admit them. Now, we see this with disputes of all kinds, and I can tell you rates notices from local councils are a rich vein. Errors are made and then they're compounded with a frankly grim determination not to concede the mistake in the sometimes frankly rude or cynical manner in which such things are communicated. And then the unfairness can shift from the original decision to actually the way it's been dealt with. Now, my, my favourite of this type of uh, apology, especially for this audience, are what we call lawyer's apologies. When is an apology not an apology? Well, usually when it starts with something like, it is unfortunate that, from which you have no sense that anybody's actually sorry about anything except having to write a letter. <laughs> and many times I hear that you know, agencies don't apologise because of fear of litigation, which in my view is largely a fallacy, but in any event confirms the recommendation I made in that report about amending the Wrongs Act to prevent apologies being used as admission of liability in civil proceedings. There is evidence that a good apology has the power to heal, and in doing so, prevent a dispute from escalating. Perhaps the Ombudsman could become the great yeller after all. So, uh, my last and in fact my favourite complaint story um, is, is, is this one. Because when you're thinking about imbalance of power, you know, the origins of the Ombudsman, imbalance of power, it's pretty hard to beat the story of a very elderly resident in an aged care home uh, up against the government. So meet Alan Lorraine, aged 91, who was living in an aged care home that went bankrupt. Now, it wasn't a government facility, but it was, a, um, it was registered with and supposedly regulated by the Department of Health. Now, the home went into liquidation, and when it did, it took with it the bonds that had been paid by the residents of the family for about four and a half million dollars. And the impact this had on the residents, you can imagine, you know, wasn't just about money, it wasn't about simple dollars and cents, it was about their, their dignity, their independence, you know, their, their, their peace of mind. So Ellen Lorraine complained to the department, and you know, this quote that I, I put up gives you a sense of what was going on there, because he figured something must have gone wrong, he didn't know what it was, but something must have gone wrong for a regulated facility to go bankrupt like that. And he was, he got classic stonewalling bureaucracy. Everybody denied responsibility. It just wasn't their problem. And then he complained to my office, and we began making inquiries. And what we found was so concerning that I launched a formal investigation. And in the report I tabled a few months later, and here it is, you can read it online for yourself, I described the department's handling of mentone gardens as a litany of failings. But investigation is all very well. You're tabling reports in Parliament is all very well. What is the fair, what is the just outcome for people like Alan Lorraine and the residents of Mentone Gardens? Well, you know, people had sold family homes to pay for their care in their old age. Well, that seemed pretty obvious. So a key recommendation to the government was that it make an ex-squash of payment to the residents who'd lost money when Mentone Gardens went out of business. Now, the point I made to an emotional meeting of, of, of residents and families when I tabled the report is that I can't enforce my recommendations. But I can and I would monitor them. In fact, I'd written to the minister during the investigation to put him on notice that I was minded to recommend an ex gratia payment and knowing, of course, that governments rightly don't hand out public money lightly. So when I tabled the report in April, I referred to the letter I'd written the previous December, and I formally recommended that the payments be made by the end of June. Now, I made it very clear to the minister that the recommendations were entirely a matter for him, but that I intended to make it public. I'm very happy to report the government paid out $4.33 million to the families, residents and their families. Everybody entitled to it got paid, and I'm particularly very fond of this picture because uh, the persuasive powers of the Ombudsman strike again, and Alan Lorraine got an Order of Australia medal for his efforts. So, now I don't just deal with complaints. It's a little bit about the, the other aspects of it. I also deal with maladministration, but usually something short of outright corruption, but still wrong. Now, with this work, we come across people acting on their temptation to do things the easy way, or to cut corners, or do things with ulterior motives, you know, like hire all their friends and relations. Um, 
And, then, and many of the people then try to justify their actions by claiming the rules don't really apply to them. So I'm just going to give you one example of that, which the skiers in the audience may have uh, heard of, uh, which is uh, my investigation into allegations of improper conduct at Mount Buller and Mount Stirling. Anybody heard of this case? Any skiers in the audience? Well, this focused on the use of public funds by some of the senior management and board of the uh, Mount Buller Resort. And what we found was a CEO there who felt it was perfectly okay to use public funds to entertain his friends and family with free holidays and uh, ski passes. That's a direct quote from um, one of his emails. Uh, he thought it was particularly, he was completely okay to take a lovely long holiday, uh, to, using more than $8,000 of public money on his family. And um, he thought it was all okay because um, he was using his professional network <coughs> to provide family holidays to his friends. It wasn't just the CEO, in fact, uh, we also uh, found the property manager of the resort was using over $24,000 of, of the public purse on family trips as part of his research and development. And what he told us when we interviewed him that, well, of course he had to take his family because he was researching a family resort. Now, these kinds of cases boil down to the core principle that you really hope you shouldn't have to communicate to public servants that taxpayers' money should not be used for personal gain, whatever the excuse. And part of my role is to look at the cleanliness of the hands and perhaps the fingernails of those who take from the public purse. And by the way, uh, neither of those people is currently employed in the Victorian public sector. So, let me say something finally about the human rights part of my work. Anybody here familiar with OPCAT know what OPCAT stands for? Well, something that I think everybody needs to know, OPCAT is the United Nations Treaty. It's the optional protocol of the Convention Against Torture. And it's something everybody in the legal world who cares about social justice really does need to have heard of. Because we know that many people in prison have life experiences of trauma and disadvantage. And the fact is, there are causal factors there in, in, in crime. And if, if people go into prison... And, and those places get it wrong, then they come out worse than when they went in, which is bad for public safety. It's, it, it's, it's more work for our justice system. And it's not good for any of us. So what OPCAT does is shine a light on places of detention. OPCAT requires all those who sign up to it to have independent inspections of, of um, all closed environments, not just prisons, that's youth justice and, and other facilities as well. There are independent inspections that are conducted by designated bodies called national preventative mechanisms. Now, one of the great things about being the ombudsman is that I get to investigate whatever I like. I don't just investigate complaints. I've got own motion powers, and I can do whatever I think is shining a light, or anything that is working or not working. And whether, you know, whether it's an individual complaint or indeed a systemic issue, I have pretty much total discretion to look at these things. So when the Australian government ratified OPCAT in December 2017, it took about 10 years for us to ratify this treaty, by the way, uh, like many in the human rights world, I got pretty excited about that. And I decided to investigate what it would take, what it would look like, what was needed on a practical level to be OPCAT compliant for monitoring places of detention in Victoria. So we decided to carry out an inspection of the women's prison in Victoria, Dame Phyllis Foss Centre, to do it to OPCAT compliant standards. Here's my team in their OPCAPs getting in. I didn't actually wear them on the day, but um, but it, it's um, it was a it was a really important piece of work. And you can read the report for yourself. Again, that's on the website. It made lots of findings, including about um, high use of force and restraint. Uh, which, in fact, is the second highest of all of the, you know, the women's prison has the second highest use of force of all 15 Victorian prisons, which really is a bit worrisome. And I was pretty critical as well of, of the number of women who had been kept in um, long-term separation and routine strip searching. 
So I made a number of recommendations in that report, which were just that, they're recommendations. As I've said, I can't enforce them, and rightly so, and many of them have a financial or, you know, uh, or a public policy impact, and I'm not responsible for government policy or the state budget. But as I've already said, I've got the power to report, and I report on the progress of implementation, which means that at the last tally, over 95% of my recommendations are accepted, including from this report. But I'm now doing um, another OPCAT-related investigation, which is looking at the use of solitary confinement on young people. And in Australian First, I've established a multi-agency, multidisciplinary team to go in to three different closed environments, youth justice, adult prison, and secure welfare. And we're drawing on the expertise wherever we find it. So it's not just ombudsman officers that are doing this, this inspection. We've seconded somebody from the Human Rights Law Centre. We've taken people from statutory agencies around Victoria with expertise in mental health and childhood trauma. So that is what we are doing at present. So what solitary confinement? Just, just for a moment. It's known by many names. It's called segregation. It's called isolation, separation, lockdown, supermax, the hole or the slot, what prisoners call it. The United Nations standard minimum rules actually define it as the confinement of prisoners for 22 hours or more a day without meaningful human contact. And prolonged solitary confinement is when that happens for 15 consecutive days, after which irreversible harmful psychological effects can occur. And there's a growing bank of evidence that suggests long-term isolation can alter the chemistry and structure of the brain. So we know solitary confinement can actually be a legitimate response in some circumstances. You know, for example, it's a temporary measure when, when people are otherwise are harming themselves or others. But the punishment for crime is deprivation of liberty, not humanity. I doubt we would have seen those shocking pictures that you know, I'm sure we all saw about the Dondale Detention Centre in the Northern Territory if OPCAT had been in place. Because what OPCAT does is ensure that these places are subject to regular independent inspections that can shine a light on cruel, inhuman and degrading practices to make sure they're stopped. So, what does any of this say about the Ombudsman and justice? Well, it's interesting to see that, you know, think about this for a moment, that the law, traditional styles of the law, would not actually have found a solution in the cases I've described. But there's uh, more than one way to peel the potato, as the cat lovers among us like to say, and justice comes in all different colours and forms. One of the great joys of the role is not to be bound by precedent or the rules of evidence or the limitations of our adversarial system. And I just want to end on this wonderful quote from the Irish statesman Edmund Burke from 1775. It is not what a lawyer tells me I may do, but what humanity, reason and justice tell me I ought to do. It is the guiding principle of ombudsman the world over, and I commend it to you. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions at this point if there are any questions in the room. Um, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to ask, how much interaction do you have with the ombudsman from the other jurisdictions within Australia um, in terms of, because with, with OPCAT obviously it's an international um, protocol that was then incorporated. I was wondering if there's cohesion between the jurisdiction or whether you consult them to kind of see how things work in their jurisdiction? Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of interaction between ombudsmen. There's two different types of ombudsmen, I should say. There are parliamentary ombudsmen of which I am one, and there are seven of us in Australia. So every, the, the states and territories have an ombudsman, and there's a Commonwealth ombudsman dealing with, with um, 
with uh, you know, federal common public services. And we talk to each other a lot. So we, you know, with things like OPCAT, you know, we, we share experience. Uh, there's also industry ombudsmen you know, who deal with, you know, and that's a response to privatised services. And we, we liaise with them, but, that, but that's much more around you know, sending complaints in their direction when they you know, wrongly come to my office. So with something like OPCAT, uh, you know, my, the investigation I've done, I've shared with all of my colleagues, you know, I've shared with the human rights um, commissions and, and, you know, at, at both uh, state and federal level, and we regularly talk about uh, what we're doing. Now, none of us, except the Commonwealth Ombudsman, have actually been formally designated as NPMs, because every state will decide what it wants to do, and none of them actually have made any decisions yet, right around Australia. No, no state, you know, no um, place where, where prisons are located has actually designated who's going to do it. It may be the Ombudsman, it may be somebody else, so not necessarily. So it, it, we could have a very different system because ombudsmen aren't going to be responsible for who designates them, for instance. And, and we'll see. But whatever the system is that governments decide, we, we talk to each other, and that's very, very important. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Prisoners. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, prisoners are the number one source of complaints to my office. Uh, and look, there is a reason for that. If you go into every Victorian prison, there is a, 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 a piece of cardboard by the phone because there is a free call to the Ombudsman's office for every Victorian prison. So unlike the wider Victorian public, they know how to complain to me. And they do. So we get thousands of complaints from prisoners. And that's really important, because if you think about imbalance of power, you know, the, you know, the ultimate powerlessness is to be deprived of your liberty. So it's something that's been around for well over 10 years, that, that free call service. Um, types of complaints absolutely range from everything. You know, I lost my trainers and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the prison can't find it, through some really serious human rights abuses and, and, and everything in between. Uh, what I, I, I look at these, we, we, do, we do find themes, we report on these. I did a big piece of work in 2015 about rehabilitation in prisons, which you might like to, you know, to have a look at. Uh, and that looked, it started with prisons and then went across, you know, ranged across the justice system around the impact of, of, of the increasing numbers in our prisons and, and, and how it was not um, uh, supporting um, the uh, rehabilitation. So, yes, it, it's, a, it's a very big theme for us, and it, it comes on the phone, so we get, it, it, it's constant. Yeah. Um, can you begin your thoughts around talking about Indigenous Indigenous community artworks, joining the migration, and something that in the past so strong was picked up from migration. Um, I investigate probably at a, at a, at a, a less um, philosophical level than that. If you, I mean, I, I'm sure we could have a good discussion about about this one. But the kind of human rights cases I I look at are more directly when there's you know when there is a breach of the charter. You know, we, we have a human rights charter in Victoria, which is wonderful, and which sets out such things as you have a right to be treated humanely when you're deprived of your liberty. So it, it's the charter that that, that really provides the, the, um, the, the boundaries, I suppose, of our, of our involvement in, in human rights issues. Pretty extensive. Uh, are you familiar with the charter? Do have a look at the charter, because well, it actually is a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. We don't. Uh, yeah. There are. There are. And, and at least we have a charter in Victoria. Maybe I think Edna's saying it's perfect, but at least we have one. Thank you for that. I saw a um, something at the back. I didn't. Let me let me switch to, to the side of it. Yes. Um, yes. No, I mean, I, I could investigate without receiving a complaint. But, but just to be clear, the disc complaints about discrimination would be dealt with by the Equal Opportunity for Human Rights Commission rather than my office, because they have a statutory mandate to look at discrimination. Um, if, um, I mean, I, and, and again, you know, with, with, with what I accept is that the system is incredibly complicated. You know, who deals with what complaint? You know, how do you, you deal with these things? So. The, the, the initial answer is I don't need a complaint to look at something, but I do, I do need to have jurisdiction. And if there's another body that, 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 would, that normally assumes that jurisdiction, I'm likely to stand back and say, actually, the, the appropriate place would be there. So it, it depends would be, would be the answer to that. It's pretty bad. I mean, I, 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 I am not, you know, I, I'm not going to do an international comparison, uh, although at the moment we've got somebody from the UK inspector of prisons out with us doing the, the inspections in, in, into, into isolation, and I think he thinks it's a lot worse here than, than the UK, so I, I, I don't disagree with you about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are. There are. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I mean, it's, it, it, will, it will always be, it's been a focus of mine since I came into the role. Uh, and I think it will be a focus of mine throughout the 10 years of my term. And if, if there's one thing where I hope I can make a difference in this role, it is actually is to get the message through that prisons are not the answer. Now, you know, just to say a little bit about the role of, you know, I mean, I've talked about, you know, I'm, I'm independent, but I also, and I, and I believe this really passionately, being independent does not mean being neutral. And I'm not neutral about such things as social justice. And I'm not neutral about the kinds of things that we, we, you know, we find within our prison system and in the wider system you know, that are not working. So although we don't advocate for people, and I can't do that in my role because that would compromise my independence, I am an advocate for, for, you know, for, for social justice and the issues that will make us make Victoria a better place. A and I've said really clearly and loudly, I think, to government, that at the rate we're going, the amount of money we're spending on our prisons, we will soon have to make some choices between whether we, we are, are, are building prisons or building hospitals. And we can't do that. <coughs> yeah. Um, I noted that your uh, recommendations regarding the aged care facility were actually quite, you were quite recent to the job at the time. And, um, calling for a pretty big uh, recommendation. I was wondering whether you felt that any political implications are ever considered consciously or subconsciously when you're making your recommendations. Oh, that's a very good question. You know, it, the, the thought did cross my mind, uh, you know, when I was recommending about a four and a half billion dollars. That's, um, that's a big chunk of my budget. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, you, and, and in the back of your mind, you think, hmm, but actually, what, what, what is absolutely crucially important in this role is to have the courage of your convictions. And um, I, I'm, you know, as the ombudsman, I have, I have tremendous independence. I don't, do you know how you get rid of the ombudsman? Anybody know how you get rid of the ombudsman? It takes a joint resolution of both houses of parliament. So I think I'm pretty safe for my 10 year term. So as I said, tell members of the parliament, you're kind of stuck with me. So, you know, you, and 
what also I think is important is the power to publish. So, you know, yes, I, you know, when I thought about these things, I, you know, they, I thought, you know, what's the right thing to do here? Because that's the only kind of recommendation I can make as the ombudsman. And, you know, could I have compromised, done something? Well, the lovely thing about being an ombudsman appointed for a 10-year term is it doesn't matter if the government doesn't like you. They're stuck with you. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, they're, 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 I think that's probably right. Um, you certainly would, would you know, if, if the government loved the ombudsman, there'd be something a bit dodgy going on. Um, I saw a question at the back. Um, my eyesight. Did somebody have a hand up there? No. I might, I might need somebody else who, who has better eyesight than me to actually. Uh, <laughs> yes, in the front. Thank you so much for your um, talk tonight. Um, I'm just wondering if you would share with us perhaps the opportunities and, and the impacts uh, that you might have in developing legislation uh, following some of your reports. It's, I find it interesting the tie-up that you had uh, with your investigation into one of the uh, aged care facilities. And of course, we've got an aged care Royal Commission going on and so on. I'm assuming that you have, that in your role you need to uh, present to a Victorian equivalent of a, uh, a, a what do you call it, a, an investigation? Um, Parliamentary Commission. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Would you, could you comment on, on those, what sort of impact that you may or may not be able to have and how carefully you have to keep your hands clean? Yes, clean hands. I, I'm very fortunate in my recommendations that I can make whatever recommendations I like. You know, I'm not constrained by, you know, so whether it's a recommendation to pay millions of dollars or to change the law or to, you know, or, or that somebody ha, ha, needs, to, needs to face a, a, some sort of misconduct uh, panel, they're all, you know, whether they're individual or systemic, they're all possible. So it does depend on the case. You know, if... If I think that there is something fundamentally wrong with the law when, um, you know, around a case that I'm looking at, I will recommend a change. I rarely make change, recommend changes to legislation. It, it certainly, I certainly have, but it wouldn't be the um, majority. More likely, I mean, often what we find in, in the systemic cases is that the law is, is generally okay, and even the guidance is generally okay. People just aren't doing it. So, you know, that, that's, you know, more often than not, it's how do you change the culture inside a department or an agency so they do the right thing? They exercise discretion properly. You know, the law won't, changing the law won't help a, a, a public servant sensibly exercise discretion. And that's very often the sorts of thing that we encounter. But, you know, but I do make recommendations for, for, um, for reform periodically, and they usually take enough, it's... They're the hardest because they're, they're the ones that, you know, where do they sit with the government's program and they do happen. And I do monitor them and I do report back. So if you're interested in this, take a look at the report I, I put out in um, July of, of last year, which was a report on what's happened to all the recommendations I've made up until then. Any more questions? Are people getting ready for their drinks? Oh, there is one at the back. Yes. Sorry, uh, thank you very much for your lectures. And this is my second time attending your lecture and it was very inspiring. Um, I'm just curious that you have been mentioning about the Doctor Who metaphor and I am very impressed by that as well. So would you, um, as, as uh, the, maybe the first female um, ombudsman in the office, would you like to address like maybe a couple of lines to the future like law students, female law students? Um, in their pursuing their career, their legal careers um, in their lives. Oh, that's a yeah, that's that's a, a, a an interesting one. Um, look, uh, you know, I, I was I, I haven't said anything much about my career. You've heard a bit about it earlier, but I, you know, I left Australia uh, on a one-way ticket and a rucksack on my back uh, soon after finishing law school. Actually, thinking that you know I had enough of the law, and it was pretty funny to come back thirty years later as the ombudsman. 
and find that you know the entire legal profession wanted you know to me to talk to their students. <laughs> uh, so I never thought of myself as as a as a lawyer or or, or, or indeed connected to to the law much at all. But obviously I am. And what I I was also surprised about when I came back into the role was, was how much gender was an issue in Australia. Because I had been working uh, for the last 30 years in very male-dominated roles, police, you know, uh, financial services, where I, you know, I, gender, I didn't regard it as an issue, I didn't even think about it. And I'd been working in those leadership roles for, for decades, and I come back to Australia, and all of a sudden, you know, will you talk about women in leadership? And my initial reaction was, what's the big deal? You know, why, why should, you know, this even be necessary? But I've come to realise that it is necessary in my position because there are, sadly, so few of us to be role models as far as we can and to, to say to the women among you, you, can, you too, you know, you too can be a pretty average law student and end up as a Victorian ombudsman. <laughs> Believe in yourself. Don't listen to the little voice in your head that is full of doubts. Shall I end on that note? Uh, in your tenure so far, you've had quite an impressive record of addressing um, different issues, but you're only halfway through. Uh, what do you foresee or the particular issues that you'd like to address uh, in your remaining time? Well, one of the lovely things about the world is you never know what you're going to get next. You know, I wasn't expecting to get the red shirts case, for example, uh, or, you know, or for that to end up in the High Court. Uh, one of the things I, I, I do talk about, you know, when I, when I do leadership type talks is, is um, beware the bullet from left field. Never plan too far ahead. So I have not planned my next five years. But I can tell you it will have a very strong social justice theme. And, and if you look at some of my reports, you know, I mean, reports are very different, you know, because I will look at the issues of the day and, you know, what people are complaining about. But there is a theme throughout that. We've been studying the prisons report in 2000 for infinite rehabilitation. I've looked at youth justice. I've looked at uh, kids getting expelled from schools. Uh, issues around, you know, mental health and, 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 and addiction. And there's a, there's, a, there's a train that goes all through those, isn't there? So, you know, so what, what I hope to, and I'll, I'll go on focusing on, on those areas and, and, you know, what does it take to actually make Victoria a better and safer place so we're not spending every billion dollars on our prison system. I, I think that will be a pretty big theme throughout my term. The other stuff, I have no idea, but we bring it on. I, I, I'm conscious that we're, we're, we're coming to the end of time. Maybe we can sh chat over a drink, but I, I, I'm... Sam, shall I... I, I leave this to you, too. To, it's, it's your gig. <laughs> um, on behalf of the Melbourne University Law Review and everyone present, I think, uh, we'd like to thank you, Ombudsman, for delivering our annual lecture tonight. Um, you might not have uh, the Honourable in front of your name, but I think uh, not many judges will be able to speak so uh, entertainingly and, and engagingly. Um, so, yeah, I think I can speak for everyone when, um, in, in saying that it was a very thought-provoking and interesting talk and great to hear a perspective on, on law and justice, maybe slightly different from what we normally hear. So um, please, everyone, join me in thanking the Ombudsman. Ombudsman.